Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 224, Finance Friday Edition, where we talk to Lauren about starting late, paying off a mortgage early, and allocating your investment dollars. So now I'm investing in a, and saving as aggressively as I can, but I also really want to live and enjoy our life because I work so hard. Um, so we're sort of in more of a slow fire approach to living, and that's really what we're focused on. How do we maximize the money that we're bringing in, make smart investing and saving de- decisions right now while being able to enjoy the things we want to do with our family and our kids? Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen. And with me, as always, is my great smelling co-host, Scott Trench. You've got an olfactory of these uh, uh, intro puns, Mindy. Thank you. (laughs) Introductory remarks. (laughs) Try again. Try again. That was... No, I like that one. Yeah. (laughs) Scott and I are here to make financial Olfactory (laughs) olfactory is an SAT word uh, that my dad taught me and reminded me of 20 times that showed up on my SAT. So Papa Trench, you get credit for the whole olfactory and remembering that years later. (laughs) I can't even stop. Okay, Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story because we truly believe that financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, or back into a paid off home and a comfortable retirement five to seven years from now. We'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Scott, I am super excited to talk to Lauren today because we ended up giving her some advice that we don't typically give people and um, a bit of confusion on my part at one point regarding tax brackets and reducing your taxable income and all of that, uh, which is then later explained by Scott in a much more cohesive manner. So uh, listen to my part of this in the beginning with a grain of salt. But well, yeah, I, I love I, her. I, I, was just, I don't think you had any confusion with this. I just think that you, like we just com- like it's a complete opposite of the advice that we would give to um, Kirsten, for example, or Kirsten from from um, uh, a few episodes ago when she's getting started and needs to be contributing to a Roth or foregoing those retirement accounts just because of the different circumstances that Lauren is in today. And so it's like it's this art of how to manage your money. There's no right answer. There's only best guesses based on where you want to go and what your circumstances are today and all that kind of stuff. So it's just fun and different every time with this kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely the advice that we give Lauren are based is based on the fact that she makes a lot of money, is in a high tax bracket, lives in a high cost of living area, and has specific goals and is not looking to retire when she's 30. I think if she had all of this combination but was a different age then we would have slightly different advice for her. Um, But by the time she has reached her financial independence goal, she doesn't have a whole lot of time left before she can start taking withdrawals from her uh, 401k plans and, you know, without incurring a lot of penalties. So without incurring any penalties, right, Scott? 59 and a half, you don't have to pay any penalties. So it's just... Episodes like this are so much fun because it really makes me think outside of the norm, you know, spend less than you earn and start a business and blah, blah, blah. Well, sometimes there's different levers to pull. So this is a lot of fun. Before we bring in Lauren, I have to tell you that the contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice. And neither Scott nor I nor Bigger Pockets is engaged in the provision of legal, tax, or any other advice. You should seek your own advice from professional advisors, including lawyers and accountants, Regarding the legal, tax, and financial implications of any financial decision you contemplate, Lauren and her husband make an excellent salary, but they live in a high cost of living area and also got a bit of a late start on their journey to financial independence. They want to be financially independent in the next 12 to 15 years and are looking for both a double check on their plan and ways to further optimize it. Lauren, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. I'm super excited to jump into your situation. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, you may have gotten a late start in life, but you guys, I think you're doing pretty good. I have a sneak peek at your investments and I'm really excited for you to run through those for our listeners. But before we get to investments, let's look at income, debts, and expenses. Okay. Well, um, my husband and I combined make about $281,000 a year. Um, 
that mostly is my salary. Um, I make t- almost two hundred ten thousand dollars a year um, working in the nonprofit sector, <clears throat> and um, our debts are really just our mortgage and a HELOC connected to our mortgage. So we have about four hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars on our house, and about eighty-four thousand dollars on a HELOC. Okay, all right. so. All that income and only those two debts. Yes. Yes. Is there any Where... variable income? No. So that's just, just all salary. salary. It's okay. all salary. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, Where's that we, money going then? We just recorded <laughs> another show with Scott and Gina, and we spent 30 minutes going through their income <laughs> stores. <laughs> their income yeah. stores. Yeah. 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 Uh. Um, it's going to a lot of places. So the biggest expense that we have is our mortgage, which we refinanced, um, to take advantage of the low interest rates and shifted to a 15 year fix, which I know you guys have feelings about, but I really wanted to have that mortgage behind us. Um, and so that's a little, it's almost $4,200 a month between our mortgage, our insurance and our taxes, which are all in escrow. Um, so that's a big piece. And then, um, and then we save about $4,000 a month. Um, a a thousand of that we, I invest, uh, into a betterment account. And then, um, about 3000, I'm really moving aggressively into our, um, emergency fund, which has been low. Um, and then the rest is comprised of a variety of expenses from, um, our HELOC payment, our gasoline, which is $280 a month. Um, we have life insurance and car insurance at $340 a month. Um, our utilities, um, $280 a month, groceries, $660 a month. Um, camps and childcare at $600 a month. We have aftercare for our kids and they're in camp all summer because of our job schedules and it's expensive where we live. Um, and then we have home. We spend about $700 a month in anything from running to Target to um, paying for our alarm system, that sort of thing. Um, and then I put a little bit of money away in a several like discretionary accounts. So I put $200 a month away for holiday purchases. So we're ready for Christmas for family and the kids. Um, and I put $300 away into a travel fund so that we can um, uh, pay for any travel costs with cash. Um, we pay, we spend about $250 a month on charity or donations and then sell um, $310 a month between sell and internet costs. Um, and, then mis- and then we have miscellaneous costs between... Um, medical things like orthodontists, um, the gym, and just spending money, which is a little over $1,600 a month for those types of costs. And so total, we come to about 8,000, is that right? Yeah, it's about it's about 8,000. We take home about $14,000 um, $14, a month. And then between our mortgage, which takes off 4,000 of that, that leaves $10,000. And then I, I invest the amount that I mentioned, and then the rest is all our living expenses. And what, so we have, we have, uh, roughly 14,000 a month coming in and 8,000 a month going out. Um, most of that is the mortgage and housing expense, um, more than half of it. And okay. we've got a, a pretty good investment approach with that. What's the, what's the goal? We have no, we have no debts besides the mortgage and the HELOC. Um, What's the yeah. goal? And then let's walk through what you currently have from investment, an investment standpoint. I just want to, I mean, m- my career has been great. I work, as I mentioned, in the nonprofit sector. But when I started, I was making $24,000 a year living in the Bay Area and tried to stretch, you know, $20 over the month. Um, and I really focused on building my um, income and really leaned into my own career development in the beginning of my, you know, my adult life. And that took like 13 years really to realize. And at the time I was saving, but, you know, I would save $20 into my 401k a paycheck because I just wasn't making that much. And I upped it every time I got a promotion, Um, but it wasn't a whole lot. And my company didn't match in the beginning. So I just felt like we had this, we were um, behind the curve for those early years when, when time is really on your side. 
So now I'm investing in a, and saving as aggressively as I can, but I also really want to live and enjoy our life because I work so hard. Um, so we're sort of in more of a slow fire approach to living, and that's really what we're focused on. How do we maximize the money that we're bringing in, make smart investing and saving decisions right now while being able to enjoy the things we want to do with our family and our kids. Um, and so that's really the goal. And then hopefully um, I can get to a point when the house is paid off that uh, I can make different choices about what kind of career I have and how much income I need to have coming in. I can consult or really scale back or even try something new and break out of the grind that I've been in for the last 20 years trying to build up my career. Got it. Well, let, let me just kind of go well, let, let's let's walk through your current investments first, and then I'll give you a couple of thoughts that I that are starting to form in my head here. Okay, so right now in our four hundred one k, we have about three hundred and ninety thousand dollars. Most of that is in my four hundred one k, and a little bit in my husband's. I max out my four hundred one k, and then my company has a pretty generous match, so they match six percent of my salary, just flat out, and then they also match. Um, 50% up to 4% of my contributions, which is really great. And that's helped us save over the last six years that I've been with them. My husband's 401k is not great. I don't love the investment choices that his company offers. And so we're investing just a little bit, maybe like $150 a month into his 401k. So we're not maxing that out. And that's one of my questions for you is whether or not that would be something to consider. Um, we have about $40,000 in a Roth that I um, saved uh, when I was making underneath the threshold, but now we're over the income limit for Roth. So we, we aren't investing in the Roth, but I have been looking at doing a backdoor Roth conversion. And that was another question I had for you as well. Um, we have about $21,000 in an emergency fund uh, and a high yield savings account. And we have about um, $30,000 in a brokerage account. Um, uh, comprised of just a few different stocks that I purchased actually in my 20s. And then um, I have about $35,000 in um, our Betterment account. All right. So how would you peg your net worth? I've been trying to, to follow here, but I, maybe like four or 500 outside of the primary? That's correct. So yeah, we have about $500,000 invested and then our home comprises a big piece of our net worth. And how much is the home worth and what's the debt against the home? So we have a mortgage of 488000 and right now the home is worth around $1.1 million. Awesome. And you have a HELOC as well, right? Yeah, we have a HELOC that's eighty eighty four thousand. 84000 All right. So here is my instinctive reaction to what you just kind of have, have articulated here is obviously you're doing great. You have an income and expenses and a huge gap between the two and you're investing. But my first reaction is that you're spe what you're building towards here is almost all of your wealth is going to end up inside of that 401k and that home equity, given the, the choices you've made without a change in al allocation strategy. And so if your goal, as you said earlier, is to get yourself out of that grind or have a chance to slow roll in a few years, this is not going to do it, or it's going to be a very, uh, uh, it's going to be, it's a, it, you have to change your asset allocation here with a couple of mm -hmm. these things. When you have 40, your biggest investment decision, whether you're making it on a conscious basis or not every month, is $4,200 towards your mortgage on that 15-year note with that. And so every month, you're just cashing in into equity in this uh, uh, home that's worth $1.1 million, which is you know maybe appreciating at, at certain rates. You know, obviously, you're in a good market if, you're, if the home is worth that much with that. But that is the that's the asset allocation strategy here, right? That that's being implemented currently without a change in place, and the rest of it's going into the four hundred one k. So your your situation is you have fifty thousand or dollars or so, which is six months in your in your savings account and your brokerage account. Well, I guess you also have the money in, in Betterment, but you mm -hmm. have you have a little less than a hundred thousand dollars available to supplementing your income right now. And it's probably generating a, a few thousand dollars a year at most in dividend income, I'd imagine, which is totally irrelevant or immaterial to your position with that. It's not even 1% of your household income likely is coming from these passive sources at this point in ways you can access. So am I, am I kind of stating the elephant in the room? Is that, is that, is that the place yes. to start maybe with this? That's a great place to start. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, I think that, you know, Look, if, if you want an event to happen in 10 years where you cross the threshold and you're done, 
this is going to do it because you're going to be at this point where you've you've got a huge 401k balance, you've got a paid off house, and you've got whatever was left over in these other th- and these other things to last you until traditional retirement age. And this will do that, but you will not have a continuum where your position is steadily improving in a way that's giving you freedom in the here and now with this asset allocation approach per my estimation with this because you just have no assets available to spend with those types of things. All your wealth will be in the 401k and the home equity. Um, So if you want that, that's fine. But if you want to gradually begin reaping freedom, more and more freedom from a day-to-day perspective in the here and now, here are a couple of huge, the first places I would start. One is taking that awesome, great match, of course, let's do that. But then can I refinance the home into a 30-year, for example, and allocate 3000 or 2500 to that mortgage payment instead of 4200 and the rest into more accessible investments like um, brokerage accounts or real estate or those other types of things are buffering my emergency reserve there or just paying down the house. I think the difference is 1.6 years between a 30-year and a 15-year at, at a certain interest rate assumptions. Mindy and I did the math. Um, a while back in one of the former money shows, but you still retain that option to pay down the fifteen the, the mortgage in sixteen years if you have, you know I think is the difference with that um, with that. But but how what's your what's your what's your instinctive response to what I'm I'm describing there and pointing out this this um, where I think this is likely to lead over the next couple of years with your your asset allocation decision? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I've been sort of grappling with. Is did we did we over allocate ourselves toward our house payment? And are we losing, I already feel like we lost time on the front end of my career. And are we losing time now in being able to invest more? Um, And do we want to refinance, even though we just refinanced within the last year, do we want to refinance again and stretch that out? So we have more flexibility with where our money is going. And even if it's going to a place where I could eventually pay off the house, if I wanted to down the road, I'm investing now. So I heard you say at the very beginning of the show, we have a 15 year mortgage because we wanted to pay it off. So that says to me, and I agree with Scott that you should get a 30 year mortgage because it's longer, but I'm also not making any of your mortgage payments for you. Sorry. And that is, you know, wanting to have the mortgage gone is, an honorable desire. We, you know, it's, it's a personal preference financially. I think it makes more sense to have a 30 year loan because the payment is so much lower, but Scott, she's also making boatloads of money. So I think that that's not, you know, I I think that's a conversation for you and your husband to have. How much do we value having a paid off house versus how much do we value more room in our monthly budget? Mm -hmm. Um, I have several questions. You have approximately a $6,000 difference between the income and the monthly spending. And you said 3000 is going to emergency fund, 1000 is going to investments. That's still only $4,000. So there's another $2,000 someplace that isn't quite accounted for. So rather than like, you don't have to answer to me. I was just, I would encourage you to go back through your spending and see if there's either unaccounted for spending and maybe your monthly spending is closer to 10 or Mm -hmm. is it, you know, are you putting more towards your emergency fund or more towards your investments than you think you are? Um, But also how much do you want your emergency fund to be? Because if you continue that the rest of this year, you're going to have an additional $36,000 in there. You have 21,000 in the emergency fund now, are you aiming for a certain number of months of spending in there or I'm not I'm aiming for around 40 to 50,000 dollars in our emergency fund just to have coverage for four months, four to five months um, of like if you eliminated some of the savings and investings that that we do, our raw fixed costs are around five fifty five hundred to six thousand that we would really need to make every month and um I, I, my job security is pretty good and I work in an industry where I'm in high demand. So I'm not worried about getting a new job. So I don't feel the need to have like a, you know, hundred thousand dollars in our emergency fund. I'd rather put that into something that can grow and, and be a little more aggressive in terms of investment returns. Okay. You, you, um, how, how committed are you to, like, what do you want to 
where do you want to be in three to five years from a state? Like, do you want to be in, in the same location that you're in, uh, in the same house, in the same city? You know, what, what do you want to be doing at that point? Or, or what, what is the timeline? Is it a seven year outlook? Is it a, you know, I don't, like how, how, depending on age of your kids with those kinds of things, like what's the end, what, what, what is a good timeline to begin thinking around? Like at this point in time, I want to be here. Yeah. So I think we love where we live. We have a really great lifestyle here. Um, and we love our home and it's a fine home. And so there's part of me that's like, let's pay it off and have that freedom and flexibility to do whatever we want and rent the house out and live in Spain for three months or, you know, do whatever we want. Um, my daughter will be in college in five years. Um, and my son will be in high school. So, um, so we're looking at the college years for the kids. They'll, that'll all be wrapped up, but they're, they, they'll be through college by the time we have our house paid off or in those, that 15 year time window. So that's really where things get pretty flexible for us. Um, so in three to five years, I sort of imagine myself here doing the same thing, but having a different position in terms of our investments and just really being, um, diligent with that. Okay. So, so in that case, it, what I'm hearing is three to five years, same spot, but in seven, eight years, kids are in college. That's when we want the optionality that the finances can afford with that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Is that is that more of a specific way to frame, to, to begin thinking around things? Yeah, that, that seems right. So in that case, look, in that case, planning on around an event-based system like this, where it's not gradually compounding, makes perfect sense. If you could back into, hey, in, in seven years, if I just keep doing what I'm doing and keep my expenses low, I'm going to have large, pretty much a paid off mortgage. Um, house is done. I'm going to have a really nice fat 401k and I'm going to steadily increase my after tax, tax brokerage accounts and emergency reserve over that period of time. You'll probably be a, you know, have a million or two, you know, a, a million plus in investments with those types of things um, and a paid off home and your expenses drop to 3,800 a month. Uh, uh, all in with that, maybe less when the kids are in college with that. So in that case, you probably don't have to change too much if you want to do that, but just know that you will be grinding for the next five, seven years from a financial position and you will not have like the, a lot of flexibility or freedom with that until you've, you've kind of eliminated it unless you make, unless you make a change with those types of things, I think. Mindy, what are, yeah. you, what are you reading? I'm hearing a lot of those same things. I'm wondering, because her company has such a stellar 401k match, what is the lowest amount of contributions that you can make to get the entire match? And I would almost want to start doing that, reducing your after tax, I'm sorry, your pre-tax contributions while still getting every dollar that they're giving you, because that's free. Mm -hmm. Um and then just changing that to an after tax. Well, because you're at such a high tax bracket, like what are you really reducing your taxable income? It's like after a certain point, it's not, you're not really doing anything for yourself. And do you know what I mean? Like that, yeah. does that make sense? Oh yeah. So that's, I think that's you're just, at that, that point. Thought. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're at that point. So let's go ahead and pay the taxes on that, that you're already going to have to pay anyway. Put them in the after tax. Um, you mentioned that you have some after tax in a brokerage account, individual stocks that you bought when you were in your 20s. Yay for you, because there's a lot of people who did not do that. Um, I think you did a great job with what you had at the time. So you're unnecessarily harsh on yourself because um, you're still in a really great position. And then I would look into, I would personally put that money into uh, index funds. Yeah. I really like index funds and we have been divesting ourselves of our individual holdings that we no longer want to have and putting it into index funds. So that's something to look into. Um, if you don't have the like company knowledge and, and time to research the individual stocks, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going into specific individual stocks. Yeah. Um, do the whole index fund, read the book, Simple Path to Wealth, and he'll tell you the same thing in a lot more words. It's still a good book, but sum it up. <laughs> Index funds. There only a, there's only a few stocks that I'm invested in in that that account, and they're all pretty solid companies. So I feel like they've. I mean, I only invested fifteen hundred dollars, and it turned into thirty thousand dollars over this time. So wow, um, yeah. So and and I had no money. I was like, oh my god, I'm going to buy a fifty dollars stock, and I was so nervous. And 
it paid off in the end. But yes, I I'm mostly I'm in index funds. Okay, good. Um, and then I don't know what current mortgage rates are. I haven't had any clients getting a loan lately. So you have a really low rate. Uh, yes. 2.375. That's an awesome rate. I would not refinance out of the mortgage at a 15 year to go into a, you know, a 30 year at 4%. So I, I would look into what rates are, just get a quote and see, um, you don't have to do anything with a quote. And well, if- well I, I, I just want to chime in and say, I slightly disagree with that. In your situation, if your goal is to back into an event, about seven years from now where you've got your home paid off and 401k and those types of things, then the current situation makes a lot of sense. But personally, if, if I were, was in this position, this, I, I would be trying to accumulate more wealth outside of the 401k and the home equity and think about investing in other assets just because the way I'm wired and the way that I think maybe a lot of listeners are wired. And my first step would be refinance that mortgage out of that 2.3% 15 year fixed and into a 30 year and wipe out the HELOC at the same time. Uh, with I was going to say that. And that combines your, your, your mortgage payment to like what, 550 and, uh, um, and probably drops your payment from 4,200 to 3,000 or so. And that frees up a lot of extra cash to begin investing in alternative assets outside that 401k, whether it's brokerage investments, real estate, or or alternatives with that. Because what will ha- what would happen in that situation is you would not have an event for 30 years where your mortgage is paid off, but you'll be able to arbitrage. You'll likely get spreads on that with index funds or real estate with that. That said, it's not the wrong answer. There's no right or wrong with any of this kind of stuff. It's just that's... that's but, but, my first, that would be how I would approach this situation. If I w- if you transplanted me into your shoes with that, is I'd make a, a, a large series of different allocation decisions. And that would just lead to, I think, a steady state compounding of options over time that will gradually materialize over the next one, two, three, four, five, seven years. But in seven years, you will be in a still growing position rather than a finished position with, with a lot of those things. So that, that would be... I just wanted to, to, sorry, Mindy. (laughs) No, that's okay. I'm going to stick by what I said and say that if you are going to significantly increase your interest rate, then how much different is your monthly payment really? So, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and when you do this, I would absolutely roll the HELOC into the mortgage and pay that off with the new mortgage if you go that route. So when you're considering how much money is going, you know, how much money am I saving? add the HELOC payment into your mortgage payment. So mortgage is 42. What's your HELOC payment right now? I think that's going to be a hefty payment. It's not that bad, actually, because our, our HELOC is at a pretty low interest rate as well. I mean, it's it's the interest rate plus prime, but right now it's like 2.8. Um, so we got a pretty good HELOC rate, but I know it'll adjust. So our payment is around $400 a month, and I always overpay. So I pay around six fifty a month. Um onto that HELOC. Okay. I, for some reason, had typed in a 6% HELOC rate. We just refinanced our HELOC to, to drop oh, it down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was like, where did I get the 6%? Okay. Yeah. That makes, <laughs> so the two point that you have on the HELOC now makes a lot more sense too. Yeah. So, okay. Um, let's see. What other questions did I have? Oh, so yeah, I would, I would, if I were in your shoes, I would call around and see what mortgage rates are right now. If you can get something close to this without an enormous amount of closing costs to refinance, that might be something to think about, or at least have a conversation with your husband. We went down to a 15 year for these and such reasons. What do we think about a 30 year? We could do some other things. Um, does your husband have a 401k, any sort of match at his 401k? No, he doesn't. Then I think the bare bones that you're doing there, or maybe even stopping, I mean, it's only $150 a month, um, and put that into after tax as well, just because there's no real benefit at your tax level and at, I'm sorry, at your tax bracket and at his no benefits part of it, it doesn't seem like that's a good place to put any money. Scott, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I, I think I think that the game here from from that perspective is shelter as much. Uh, you, your approach to investing is I'm going to pay off the home and invest inside the 401k. And so 
and you earn an enormous income right now. So to me, that says pre-tax contributions, defer taxes now, pay them later, makes a lot more sense in your case than you know maybe maybe another situation where we've got a lower income earner who's buying a lot of real estate, for example, with a lot of those things. Um, so I, I, I like that, I think, in a, in a general sense. Hmm. That, That's not that, what I was saying. Maybe I'm misunderstanding you or maybe you're misunderstanding me. I was thinking that because she's already at this super high tax bracket, reducing that by $20,000, she's still going to be paying a lot of taxes on that. Well, I, I'm saying that that's, that's the whole game, right? Because she earns so much should, money. But you think she should continue to contribute to her 401k pre-tax? I, I think I think that like what, what we said, what we decided earlier is 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 her strategy. Lauren, your, your, your strategy is I'm going to pay off my house and back into a, a seven year timeline where I'm going to be able to then reap the benefits of that freedom. And at that point, you're only going to need three, four thousand dollars a month in passive cash flow because you're going to have a paid off house with this kind right. of stuff. Right. And two kids in college your expenses are going to drop considerably with that. And so if that's the goal, then you don't need you you're, you just pay off that house and keep fund fund your 401k all the way through, defer that tax the, those taxes as much as you can and invest the rest in a couple of after-tax brokerage accounts and pile up those things. I think for me, I like deferring all the income right there because your plan is not to generate an enormous income in retirement with this. Your plan is to you know, hit hit some singles and do the base hits, enjoy life with that kind of stuff and, and flow through, I think, a really traditional approach to retirement with that. And if you're going to do that, I like the I like sheltering all the money behind the 401k in your circumstance with this and not doing the Roth. Right. I'm going to try to convince you one or two more times before the end of the episode to change that entire mentality and re- refinance to a 30 year potentially and build more assets outside the 401k because I think you'll reap more of those benefits and flexibility over the next three to five, seven years than you will with that strategy. But if that's your plan, you're going to pay off the mortgage. In that case, I like, I like the 401k and sheltering the taxes a lot with those types of things. Does that make sense, Mindy, where I'm coming? Where, you know, every time we have different advice for the guests, but I, I'm trying to I know every to single time is the, <laughs> is the strategy, you know? So, it, okay. So, so my thought is she's in the highest tax bracket. She can contribute $19,500 to her 401k. So she's really only sheltering. What's the highest tax bracket? 38%. I'm not there yet. Yeah, she's take, sheltering take the, 38% yeah. of $19,000 in the grand scheme of her investments and her income. That's not really that much money. And she has all this money in the 401k. But as you were talking, I started thinking, oh, in 15 years, she's going to be 57 years old. She's only got a year and a half before she's 59 and a half, which is when you can start accessing these funds. So I am, there's a lot of moving parts. I got to make sure I take them all into account. This is not not as easy as you think it is. See, this is what I called you. (laughs) Yeah, but no, this is perfect, right? So look, look. The plan is, and, and again, I've tried. I, I, I've said, I, I've already caveated enough. But the plan, the plan is, we got it right now. Is in seven years, both kids going to be in college, and I want it. I want an end state at that point in time, right? And that end state is paid off home and f- flexible overall financial position with all that kind of stuff, right? So you don't need any of that money right now. You are generating f- f- fourteen five a month after tax, right? You have no bonus. There's nothing complicating this. You have. $14,500 in cash coming in, you get $8,000 in cash coming out. A huge chunk of that 8,000 is going toward the mortgage and your HELOC, and that's inclusive of that. So I got 7,500 a month coming in to allocate with that. And that is going to, you're going to put 20 of that towards the 401k. That's two and a half months. Okay. Now we've got another nine and a half months to deal uh, of, of excess to go after with that. I say just max out the 401k, take the nice match for both of those fill up yours, fill up your husband's with that. Now you still got $60,000 left to invest after that. That's plenty to dump into the after-tax brokerage accounts and clean up your debts, you know, with a, with with a, a mix of allocation there. In 7 years you're sitting pretty with the HELOC paid off, most of that mortgage gone, and probably several hundred thousand dollars in after-tax brokerage accounts in addition to a very very fat 401k, and that's the that's the game plan there. But I would take every 
dollar of tax deferral that you can with that strategy. And then you can either choose to keep working or you can begin doing the Roth conversion ladder with that 401k if you choose to stop working. And that's where you can begin moving that money um, through a Roth conversion ladder. So your plan, I think the way your, your plan is, I think, very conservative um, with, with this or the goal is very conservative um, with a lot of this stuff. But I, I, I like in this case, put dumping it all in the 401ks, um, both of them. And then if you're if you don't like your husband's 401k, you can just roll it over um, whenever he leaves the job with that. But for yeah. me, that that would be the asset allocation strategy to back into the outcome that you're looking for um, that I, I think would, would make a lot of sense. Mindy, do, do, does that make does it make sense why I'm against the 401k in a general sense, but for it in this particular circumstance? Yes, because of all the specific things in her situation. Yes. So, okay. I understand what you're saying now. This is this is so much fun. Yes, we get <laughs> we have, we have a lot of different uh, different things here with that, right? And so I can see L- Laura is a uh, smiling with 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 uh, some of this stuff because it's probably different than what you've heard us say on on past shows. But no, I know okay. this tracks. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about those kids and their college funds, or their call it paying for their college. Yeah. Are they both? interested in college and is college the right choice for them? Well, that's a very good question, Mindy. And I struggle with that. Um, honestly, given I, I have a little sticky note right behind my computer, the price you pay for college, the book that, um, uh, was recommended to me by a friend and I struggle with how expensive college is. And part of the reason that I had a late start, we didn't have excessive student loans, but I came out out of college with some student loans, about $15,000. My husband had about $22,000 and it, and making $24,000 a year, it was really hard to get by in a high cost of living area. And so my goal for my kids would be to get them through college without absorbing any debt for themselves. Um, but we don't invest in a 529 plan. So I don't have a ton set aside for them. We have about $15,000 in Betterment accounts that I've just put aside for my kids right now. Um, But I know that's not going to really make a major dent depending on what kind of college they want to go to. Um, But my daughter is interested in college. She talks about it. My son is eight um, and he wants to be a pro skateboarder right now. So he's not quite talking about (laughs) college yet. You don't, you don't need college to be a pro skateboarder. Um, Good luck to him. Yes. (laughs) Good luck to us too. Uh, Good luck to you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, get Keep that health insurance. Yes, that's right. Uh, okay. So there are lots of creative ways to pay for college. We have a question in our Facebook group right now. What are some creative ways to pay for college that you have done? Uh, Julian from Rich and Regular worked at the college. And I think he was getting a master's or like a, an accelerated level of uh, education. But his college charged him $25 per semester for college. I know. I'm like, why even bother charging? But, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so getting a job at the college and planning to have a job at the college can help you with the reduction in tuition. Going to a state school instead of going to an art school. Studying a real thing instead of studying fashion design that you actually have no interest in are all really good suggestions. Um, yeah. Zach... Gautier, Gautier, I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name, Zach. He came on the podcast. Oh, I want to say, well, let's just look it up because it was not that long ago. Here we go. Episode 64. I guess it was a little bit while ago Um, with lots of different ways to pay for college. Um, The military could be an option. Do either of you have military benefits that you can pass along to her? Um, Home Depot, Starbucks, uh, maybe Costco, maybe not Costco. I can't remember. Um, They have tuition uh, assistance programs and tuition. I don't know if it's reimbursement, but there's a lot of options to pay for. And now that she's what, 13, 14, she can start thinking about this. When she enters high school, she can go into AP classes if that's something that she's interested in. Um, We have an international baccalaureate program that my daughter is specifically attending one high school so that she can participate in that. And I think you graduate high school in four years, but with like the freshman year of college already done too. So the the credits transfer over. Um, So there's a lot of options out there 
to help you reduce the cost of your college, but there's also a lot of really easy ways to incur a boatload of debt. So yeah, I think uh, that you know, we we talk to them. Well, I talked to my daughter a fair amount about college and the cost and the reality of it. We and like she is um, foc- laser focused on working at Starbucks, not only because of the college tuition, but because they do a four hundred one k match. And I talked with her about the um, benefit of investing early. Um, so we are talking through that, whether she goes to community college and then transfers to a four year, we've talked about some of the ways you can, um, hack, uh, living expenses, which comprise so much of the cost of college by doing, you know, residence assistance or getting a job, as you mentioned in college. So I think we're, we're, those are all options we're exploring. It's just, it's, it feels, um, kind of fantasy right now because I have no idea, what that's going to look like because she's just entering eighth grade. And so she's still a little bit far, farther away from that. Um, but I think those are all real. And then we put them both through um, private daycare because of we were working um, and in, in my area, it's quite expensive. So that was almost $20,000 a year for both kids um, or $20,000 a year. And my kids are five years apart. So it was a 10 year span where we were spending mm. that completely. And so part of my calculation is if I had to, I could cash flow college for them to a degree that would be similar to, but maybe slightly more expensive depending on the school, um, what we what we absorbed um, when they were really little and we needed that help. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, childcare is so expensive. That is, and I would, you know, it doesn't have to be all them or all you. It can be a hybrid situation and, you know, get great grades and I'll help you more. And if you mess around, then that's on you. And, you know, tuition reimbursement based on that, uh, that credit, the uh, credit card score, that grade, what is it when you get your report card? <laughs> GPA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's, you know, but there's lots of options and, and, Planning ahead is great. So, you know, having the conversations ahead of time is, you know, really helps to plant the seed. Hey, this is what happened to me and this is where I'm at now versus, you know, you could get a jump on it. Yeah. Um, Let's see. What other challenges do we have? I I think just just chiming in on the college thing, I, I don't think for me the college thing changes too much about the asset allocation strategy that you've got here, right? We're still backing into a seven year, 10 year timeline with this kind of stuff. At that point, you'll have a paid off house, 401k, after tax brokerage accounts, and numerous options to pay for the college. So I would just kind of go right on through your list with this kind of stuff, sheltering as much as you can from taxes while you're earning a tremendous salary and and all that kind of stuff with this 401k, maybe um, the 529s, if you're if you're interested in in using that as as one of those things. But there's that's a really limiting option. You, You don't have other other choices for that. And when college comes, you can either cash flow it by continuing to work or ELOC or, you know, a, a, a other other types of things with that. But I think I think your highest and best use is the index fund investments inside your 401k with this approach. And so, yeah. you know, the more you can put it towards that, that's going to increase your overall wealth. And then you'll have an option in one of several areas to tap into to, to pay for the college downstream. You're not going to have any trouble paying for college with your income. Uh, is the good news you, you've you've won because of the the work you're like oh I got to start a late start well <laughs> you got a late start because you were focusing on the right thing and now have a, a, a situation where you just generate so much income that you'll be able to solve all your problems and with all that with with, with, with just a pretty fundamentals based approach here yeah I wonder so I mean yes I agree with you I feel like I'm less concerned and I've always sort of been less concerned about college. Um, both because I didn't want to tie up investments in in accounts that were specific to that, not knowing what my kids would do, but also because as my income grew, I felt like we could figure that out. But I feel like if we build up our emergency fund by the end of this year to something that feels right to me, then we're going to have a significant amount of money to invest um, every month. And even if we max out my husband's 401k, we still have money left aside. And so I'm really grappling with, do I beef up what I'm putting into Betterment and put it into that index fund? Do I think about doing a backdoor Roth conversion alongside that just for six grand a year or, um, or more with my husband? Um, 
And then, um, you know, I, are there other ways to think about how we're using our after tax um, money strategically to really build wealth over time alongside the 401k? And I think that's where I struggle a bit. Yeah, I, I would start with both the 401ks. Um, you're at a nonprofit, so you probably don't have any SPP or anything like that. Um, then I think the backdoor Roths are a great option following that. If you have an HSA plan or that option available and that the family health issues allow for that, um, then the HSA would be awesome for both you and your husband to max that out and invest that. I'd probably even do that after the match, but before the remaining maxes to your 401k with, with a lot of that stuff. Then I think the Roth would be the third item after that. And then it's, are there other options for sheltering some of that money um, pre-tax? And that's where you can think about the 529 plans. If you think that there's a clear minimum you're going to spend on college with that, the 529 plans can be another good place to, to shelter money pre-tax. And you're going to then still, I mean, if you max out both eight, both 401ks at 19.5 a year, and this is all pre-tax, and your tax bracket's going to be enormous with your income and being in California with that, right? So that that's incredibly advantageous. That's not that's not actually going to make as much of a dent in your after-tax cash flow as you think. <laughs> uh, maxing both of those out, um, you'll you'll still probably have sixty, seventy, eighty thousand a year to invest. And so even when you go through the backdoor of Roths and, and, and those two tactics and 7,200 into the HSA, you're still going to have 50 grand left over after that. And then you, even you max out your 529s, you're still going to have 40, 50, 45. And so that would be where you put that into the after-tax brokerage. And so that's where I think, if you think about it from that position, it's a very luxurious position to be in where you can go through the whole list and still have plenty left over, I think, to beef up your emergency fund and, and those other types of things um, based on what I'm seeing here while paying a 15 year mortgage. Yeah, we don't have an HSA at my work. So that's, I always listen to you talk about that and wish we had one, but it's not an option. So um, so I think that's that's the only thing I, I'm not able to tap into. That's because your, your, your work offers good healthcare then. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> what what of that of that list, does anything appeal to you or do you feel like, like any of it is stuff to, to do? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think given the high tax bracket that we're in, beefing up my husband's 401k has been um, appealing. I just hate the investment options he has. They're all high fee mutual funds. So there aren't any index fund options. And so I've always struggled with putting our money there. Um, but we can do that just to shelter more of our income. And then for me, it's once we have our emergency fund taken care of, it's just dumping as much as I can into after-tax investments. Um, and so that it provides us some flexibility if things change before, um, you know, our 15 year time horizon. If I want to scale back my work a little bit because I want to spend time with my son before he goes to college, I want to have a little bit of uh, the more flexibility I can build to give myself options. I think that's where I'm starting to lean at this stage in my career where I've worked so hard. Um, that I feel like it would be nice to know that is an option, even though I'm very comfortable working. And that's, that's, I've been working since I was 16 years old. So I just don't know anything else. Um, but I can feel myself longing for, um, a little bit less stress. <laughs> okay. So less stress, does less stress look like fewer hours? Um, it sounds like you like your job and you like what you do. You're in high demand. I think after you've got the mortgage paid off, which is important to you, you've got a good solid foundation of the investments. I can see something where you pull back and you do consulting for 10 hours a week, still making a lot of money. And therefore you're less stressed because you're only working 10 hours a week. You're still generating some income and you're still doing something that you like to do. Um, does that sound like I'm going yeah. down the right path? Yeah, you okay. are. I think I'm, you know, I'm in a management position. I have a big team. There's a lot of demands on me and the idea that I have both less hours and maybe less demands of my time, um, not just in physical hours working, but just what I do when I'm at work is appealing to me. So I think a good exercise would be sometime in the next six to 12 months, 
start thinking about what parts of your job you really love and what parts of your job you really want to pass off to somebody else Mm -hmm. and see if there's a way to craft a position. Maybe you don't make 210 doing this. Maybe you make 175 and that work-life balance is so much better that it's worth the reduction in hours. Or maybe you continue going whole hog and getting more, uh, you know, getting raises and, and continuing to climb as high as you can and then pull back a little bit. But I think really sitting down and making a list of the things that you like to do and the things that you want to keep in your life helps you start thinking about how to craft a job that you're looking for. And, you know, poke your head into the uh, the job market and see what, you know, maybe somebody else at the nonprofit down the street is looking for those same things that you want to do at a reduced rate or a reduced, you know, reduced hours that make sense in some way. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, could your husband get another job? Does does he have the opportunity? And we haven't really talked about him very much here, but you said that you are making more money than he does. Could he hop to another job? Has he been at his current job for a super long time? Is there a job that has better benefits? Is there a job that has a, a HSA plan that you guys could take advantage of? Um yeah. Has he explored anything like that? He hasn't. Um, he's been at his job for quite a while. Um, he doesn't have great benefits there. They're all really on me. Um, he could definitely hop to another job, though I think at this stage, he, he's. I'm definitely the career-oriented one in the family, and he is the stability one and a great chef. Um, so, um, so that's where he really leans in. But I think he would love to do totally different things with his day than what he's doing right now. And I don't know if that is a different job or just leaning into his own hobbies and um, his own passions. I would have, I would encourage him to make a list of all the things that he wants to do and see if you can craft a job around that. Or, you know, I don't, I don't know that right now is the best time for entrepreneurship. Um, like him quitting his job and starting entrepreneurship, but maybe there's some side business that he could start or, you know, start looking into that. But uh, yeah, if you've been at your job for a really long time, your company isn't as incentivized to just give you a big bunch of extra money. But if he could take his current skills and hop a job and make an extra 20 or $30,000 a year, you can just take that and throw that into the, the after tax brokerage accounts and yeah. you know do, the emergency fund and all of that. Do you think he will be there for many more years? It really depends. He's not as motivated um to change careers based on like financial gain. So, um so I think he could stay there until he retires. He could also switch it up. Um but he doesn't um that's just not where he he spends his time thinking about his life. It, like career is like what I do, I get up, I'm part of the family, I have a paycheck and I contribute, but his interests and passions are sort of external to his professional life. Okay. Well, I I was more, I was more asking just in the context, going back to the 401k, you don't like the investment options in there. But again, like if you just dump a couple money in there for a couple of years and then transfer it over to a better plan in the future, you're good to go with that. So that would be my that that's the big, I think, financial question for from an allocation perspective is you know, you could just have him max out that out. But if you think he's going to be there for 20 years investing with the huge fees on that in that plan, maybe that changes the math a little bit. But if it's going to be three, four years or less, you know, then then those fees don't really matter because you're not going to have enough time to really drag your performance as much as the tax benefits might might accrue to you. Right. So just, yeah. Just no, those are that's good food for thought. Um. Awesome. What else? What else should we cover for you today? Well, the only other thing that I've I I have explored is whether or not I want to think about real estate investing, and I definitely don't want to think about that in the area I'm currently living, uh, just because it's such a high, <laughs> had such an expensive market. Um. But then that makes me really nervous about thinking about going into real estate investing. It, you know, in a location or a market I don't know very well, or that is even out of state to us. But that's something that I've been thinking about, even that that could become a side hustle for us or for my husband 
um, if we wanted to build up a um, rental portfolio and have that be something that we work on together, or even if I were to dial back my career at some point. Um, that's been the least thought out piece of our investment strategy. We've really been pretty um, conservative or traditional, as, as you mentioned, Scott, I'm just thinking about index funds. Um, but it's something that I'm, I'm curious about, although this current market and just how frenzied it is intimidates me. Yeah, I, I, I obviously am a big fan of real estate investing. Not that I'm biased by by any means, but um, I, I think that that would change everything about what we talked about earlier in terms of asset allocation strategy. I think that investing in real estate is possible with your current, just because you earn so much income and spend so little that you can still probably put your house in the 15-year mortgage and contribute to the 401ks and have money left over to make down payments on rental properties with that. Here, here are two traps to avoid uh, as you move in, as you think about this, one is we, we've seen California investors investing in the Midwest using their HELOC to purchase the property. That is a trap. The HELOC is a five year. You can think of it as a short term, uh, vehicle. So if you put $60,000 down on a rental property out of state with using a, using your HELOC, think of it as a five year repayment period. That's a thousand dollars a month plus interest going towards it. That's going to eat up all of your cash flow and then some, and you're actually sucking cash out of your life, not enabling your freedom and, and creating passive cash flow, at least for the five year, six year period with that. So it's a very high stress way to go about accruing rentals using the HELOC um, to, to finance the down payment in most cases, right? Even without interest, um, if you just assume it's 0% interest. The second um, trap is if you buy a $100,000 property that produces $200 a month in cash flow, you are producing $2,400 a month or a year in income, which is much less than 1% of your total income. So you'll have to buy 10 or 20 of those to be 10 or 20% of your income and be at all relevant to what you're doing from a job perspective. So if you're going to go into real estate, I think you should consider a way to make the investments in a system or at scale large enough to be somewhat meaningful to your financial position. I'd be very wary of an approach that was less than 10% of your an annual income, um, which would be $24,000 annually without a path to get there within a few years, because you'll just be frustrating yourself and creating a huge pain in the neck compared to, you know, your salary will increase much more than that over three years, most likely just with inflation, then, then that will generate. So those would be the two traps to avoid. But outside of that, I love real estate investing, and I would just encourage you then to divert a larger and larger share of your cash away from the home payments and the 401k in that case to the rental properties if you think you can get that kind of return. Other mm -hmm. places. Yeah, another trap I would uh, recommend avoiding is the trap of, oh, well, a house costs $1.1 million where I'm at. Clearly, this $100,000 property is a better deal. And the I I think Scott touched on it a little bit. Just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's a good investment, and you can still lose money every month on a hundred thousand dollar house as well. So if you truly want to learn about investing in real estate, I would watch one of Brandon's webinars on Wednesday how to uh, how to analyze a rental property or how to run the numbers and just start running numbers. Pick a place that your grandma grew up or you know your sister lives in or something so that you can just see the cities and it, like it, you, the, the Midwest is a great cash flow area, but not all areas of the Midwest are great cash flow areas. So if that's a place that you want, pick a location, find some properties and anal start analyzing those deals just to get a feel for how to run the numbers. Because once you figure out an area, like I know my city really well, I know that that house across the street is a terrible investment because it's going to generate negative cash flow forever. I mean, probably not forever, but for a really long time, that's not what I'm looking for. So if you're investing in real estate to to make money, don't buy a job that costs you money every month, um, which kind of tacks off on what Scott said. But I mean, it's really easy to live in a house at a place that's really expensive and, and look at people buying $50,000 houses thinking like, oh, I could do that all day long. Well, yeah, but are you going to really make any money on it? So um, it's totally okay to ease yourself into rental investing or any sort of investing, you know, and if real estate is exciting, but you don't want to be the landlord, uh, what about REITs or syndications or something like that? So there's, there's all sorts of different things to invest in real estate. 
Um, if you haven't decided on a plan yet, you should read the ultimate guide to what's the UBG called? Oh, the ultimate beginner's guide to real estate investing. There we go. The ultimate, like, where's the B? The ultimate beginner's guide to investing if, to real estate investing is www.biggerpockets.com slash UBG. And that's a great free resource for the different ways to invest in real estate. Uh, because it isn't all just tenants and flips and that's it. There's a lot of different options. So uh, that's a great place to get started. Okay. Thank you. All right. What What else can we cover? I mean, I think, you know, those were my main questions. I feel like <clears throat> the savings and investing I've done all on my own. Um, you know, my parents were never, we never talked about money. Um, and so it's, it's just helpful to have a sounding board to sort of figure out, am I doing this right? What am I missing? Where are my blind spots? And, and am, am I, if I continue on this path, am I going to hit those goals that I have? Um, and so just having your feedback and advice is so helpful um, as I'm trying to trudge along and, and get to a place where I can sort of think through a different lifestyle for myself that I've never really had. Yeah. I mean, you're, 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 overwhelming advantage is the incredible income, which is a clear sign of, of competence developed over a, a, a really good career here with that. So that's awesome. Um, but like, like, like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, I think the biggest decision you have to make about is about whether or not you're going to allocate that capital towards that home, because most of your, your investment approaches, I'm going to pay off my home and then use what's left over to put into the 401k and other investments. And that's totally fine. That, but that's your biggest strategic decision that you yeah. made um, and that you're making with this. And that will, I think, determine a lot of the other outcomes with a lot of this stuff. So, so I have some research to do. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think you have some research to do and think about like, hey, if, if I want to do these other things, yeah. then your, your problem is like, hey, you can probably do it all, but it's just irrelevant to your financial. You have to, like, what are, where are you concentrating your resources? You're concentrating them on paying off the, the mortgage with that. And that's the, that's the challenge with when you have such a high, high income is if you can, if you, uh, if you buy real estate, for example, $60,000 a pop, that's, that's going to annoy you. Uh, not, not, um, not, not generate wealth for you, which is a yeah. good problem to have. It's because you're, you're doing really well. You're a, you're a top earner. <laughs> yes. I, I don't need, I don't need more annoyances. I lead fewer. Yeah. Um, but I guess like that makes me think about, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, consult with our mortgage broker and see what the rates are. But there's part of me that, you know, I don't struggle with, but because I spent so much time focused on my career growth at the beginning and didn't save as aggressively, I'm looking at this 15 year time horizon and thinking, okay, like this is where you could really double and triple down on that if you wanted to. And if I scaled back some of the money that's flowing into our home, I might be able to reap the benefits of that time horizon more, um, you know, more successfully than if I, than if I'm only investing my home and then whatever I have left there is just the equity in that plus, um, whatever our income looks like at that time. So, um, that's, I think the, the crux of my question to myself. Outside of your home, your expenses are like 3,500 a month, right? So right there, around that. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're a little bit, there might be a little bit more than that, but yes. Okay, four four thousand forty. Let's call yeah. it forty five hundred to be conservative with that. So you're spending fifty thousand, sixty thousand a year outside of the home, on two hundred eighty thousand in income, you know, or whatever it is. You you are you are thus accumulating probably one hundred thousand at minimum that you are deploying towards assets, whether it's your primary residence, a principal, or other in investments. So in fifteen years, if you just keep up what you're doing, you're going to accumulate one point five million if you get a zero percent return um, on all, all that. So I think I think you will you will clearly do at least a little better than that uh, with any of the approaches we outline um, in this. And so I think I think you will not have to worry about a fifteen year time time horizon. I think it's about how do I back into like what is that optimal space here and now five three three years five years seven years and all that kind of stuff. And what's the what's the optimal yeah. earliest future optimal state I can get to? I guess with that. Yes, I think I really think we covered a lot. Yeah, I think so. Thank you for sharing all of this with us. I think yeah. it's a, I, I think it's another interesting, really awesome perspective with this. So we appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I'm, it's, a, it's a true pleasure and honor. <laughs> this was a lot of fun, Lauren. Thank you so much. This, you really made me think. 
about a lot of different things. I love it. I love it a lot. Okay, that was Lauren. And Scott, before we hear from you, I have to say, we did not do enough during the recording of this episode to praise her for where she's at today. We did it after we stopped recording. I was like, oh my goodness, you did such a great job. Like, we didn't really focus on that. She's doing really fantastically. She's got approximately $500,000 in net worth outside of her home's value, her home equity. And she has low expenses outside of that home payment, uh, which we discussed ad nauseum just in the last hour. But she's doing really, really well. And I want everybody to know that we didn't forget that. We just forgot to say it during the recording. But yeah, she's doing awesome. She's going to be Sitting so pretty. Yeah, that, that, and that's probably par- partly my fault as well with this because like I, I just hunt for the problems and go right for it all the time and often forget to stop and smell the roses with it. But I completely agree that she's, <laughs> she's doing everything right and, and it's perfect. She just has like major capital allocation. You know, there's four levers to personal finance. I said this a million times, right? But you can spend less, earn more, invest, or create. And in her situation, because of her ridiculously high income and – low expenses outside of her home payment. It's really, I think, a capital allocation game for her at this point. And that's what's going to make the big difference for her is what she invests in, how she does it, and what her structure is with that. And so we discussed the two major options, the two divergent paths here are pay off that mortgage and contribute to the 401k or build up after-tax liquidity and do the other things, right? And all day long, I, Scott Trench, will be doing the latter of those two uh, in the initial stages until I get that passive income threshold um, that I'm trying to get to as early as I can. And then I go back and do the uh, 401k and, and, and begin deleveraging from, the, from those positions to make myself more comfortable with those types of things. But um, her choice is to do it the opposite way, and that's perfectly fine. Um, it's just she's going to be working towards that for a few years without really – driving lots of liquidity into her personal life with that. But then she'll have an event again when she when her house is paid off and be done and it'll be wonderful. So there's no right or wrong answer. That that's that that's the major strategic pivot from there. And then there's a number of tips and tricks downstream to eke out a little extra return with the the four oh one Ks and the um, HSAs and the Roth conversion ladder and all that kind of good stuff that we got into. Yeah, you know something she said uh, makes me think that I need to invite our listeners to join our Facebook group so you can bounce ideas off of each other and have somebody else who gets what you're talking about to look at your situation or your specific uh, issue that you're having an, having a problem with and really review it and give you different options like, hey, here's here is it from my point of view. Here is my suggestion from my point of view, Scott is, how old are you, 30? Yep. I turned 31 I'm 48. next month. Scott will be 31 next month and I will be 49 in two months. So we're coming from very different points of view. Scott's the CEO and I'm not, and that's okay. Um, good for Scott. And I would never want your job, Scott. That looks like it would suck. But you love it, so that's great. So there's just very different points of view that we're coming from, but we know that you also have different points of view. So we have a Facebook group where you can talk about this stuff with fellow money nerds and frugal weirdos. So please jump in at facebook.com slash groups slash BP money and share your advice, share your point of view, or ask a question because we're all here to just get through this together. Absolutely. Should we get out of here, Scott? Let's do it. From episode 224 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench, and I am Mindy Jensen, saying parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say goodnight till it be morrow. Mm-hmm.